Welcome to the Best Health Radio Show. By the way, I'm in Austin, Texas, and this morning when I woke up, it was 38 degrees. Now it's 43, but it's getting up into the high 60s, so I make canoeing dates to get together with all these people. And one after another, they get in touch with me and say, I just hurt my knee in pickleball. I just hurt my joint in this. And, you know, I have decided that the healthier you eat and the healthier you think and the better tools you have, the less you get injured and this stuff doesn't happen. Well, this show is all about agile thinkers, whether you canoe or you don't canoe. And today on the show, we have one of the most agile thinkers that I know. And it's an important topic. We're going to be talking about a holistic approach to viruses. We're going to be touching on all kinds of things, even later on in the show, the new long COVID, which is now an emerging condition. So who do we have on the show today? One of my favorite people from Michigan. He's David Brownstein. He's a medical doctor and owner of the Center for Holistic Medicine. He is a board-certified family physician, even though he shares with us that the board certification tests are now mainly about pharmaceutical interventions, and he's mainly about natural interventions, which is why we have him on the show. David is one of the foremost practitioners of holistic medicine really in the country, and he's the medical director of the Center for Holistic Medicine in West Bloomfield, Michigan. I first met David right after I had had a kidney removed because I had a tumor in it, and the surgeon had promised me he would not take my adrenal gland out, which was kind of a given in those days. Whatever tissue was contiguous with your kidney, they took out, and he promised me in front of several people that I brought with me to that visit he wouldn't do it, so I assumed he didn't do it, and I went into adrenal failure out after that surgery, not understanding why. I dragged myself out of bed that I'd been in for months to a conference in Dallas, bumped into Dr. Brownstein. I asked a question, and when I asked a question, you stand up at the microphone, Um, You say a little bit about who you are. turned out that my book, Hormone Deception, had been one of the picks for that society, the Environmental Health Society of that year. So David came up and introduced himself. We immediately felt this. In Yiddish, it's called a mishpucha energy. And he said, how are you doing? I said, terrible. I had been in bed for the last so many months and had to drag myself to come here. It's the first thing I've done in months. Anyway, long story short, David was instrumental in identifying that I was suffering with adrenal insufficiency, and he wrote me a prescription for um, hydrocortisone, and I hadn't been able to function. You all know I'm a dancer. I couldn't dance for months. That night, after the first day of hydrocortisone, I went dancing that night till two or three in the morning because cortisol turns on your life force. There's a receptor for it on every single cell. So David turned on my life force. And since then, through thick and thin, and through admiring each other's elbow grease and passion, we've remained colleagues and become close friends. So he has so many books out. By the way, he lectures internationally and he's a graduate of my alma mater to the University of Michigan. But let me just tell you some of these books. And we're talking about his newest book that is launching right now called A Holistic Approach to Viruses. But he's also got Drugs That Don't Work and Natural Therapies That Do, Iodine, Why You Need It, Overcoming Arthritis, Overcoming Thyroid, Ozone Miracle Therapy, Salt Your Way to Health, Guide to Dairy-Free Diet, Guide to Gluten-Free Diet, Guide to Healthy Eating, Miracle of Natural Hormones, which kind of first put him on the map. He is not a lazy person, and he is an agile thinker. So we've got him on the show today to talk about how to boost your immune system with agile thinking. So welcome to the show, my dear, dear friend. Thank you for having me. I, I remember that meeting in Dales. I would think it's, I'm guessing, 10 or 15 years ago. That was a long time ago. I think it was... Um, longer than that. <laughs> I remember that meeting. And uh, I asked you twice, what's your name? And you you said it. And I came back to it later. I'm like, you wrote that book. You know, and it was the, the Hormone Deception book. And um, um, it's still up on my bookshelf over there somewhere. And I still refer to it. 
You know, yeah. I was thinking about it a lot because right now the gov- the ex-governor of Michigan is being indicted for what has happened to the water in Flint, Michigan, with lead being in that water. And I have a whole chapter on lead toxicity in children's brains that's pertinent today, but in that book, Hormone Deception. Yeah, that's just uh, good. The indictment happened this week. Did yeah, it? Um, you know, the uh, what a disaster that happened in Flint. And it's not just Flint. Because lead toxicity is still, unfortunately, alive and well in our country. You know, I diagnose it all the time in patients. But, so do you what do you order um, a blood test for lead on every new patient that comes in? Or, is there an, or do you do a provocation test first? I do a hair testing on every patient that comes in and pick it up there a lot of times. And then I order the blood and the provocation testing. But I, I will order, I order provocation testing on a lot of people. I mean, just... Lead is certainly the number one toxicity that I see. Lead and mercury, they're neck and neck, unfortunately. Can you talk about just what you do for your provocation test so someone didn't know what it was? So we, the, the body doesn't like heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, um, aluminum. I think I got most of them. Um, and it binds them up. So th- these are neurotoxic chemicals. They disrupt hormones, they disrupt all the cells in the body. And so when we're exposed to lead and mercury and cadmium and, you know, so on, the body will bind them away into fat tissue and try and store them away to keep them away from, uh, you know, tissue we need to live, you know, like, like nervous system tissue. And um, the problem is when people lose weight, um, you know, these, these, toxins are stored up in their fat cells and these toxins get released when you start losing weight. So the only way that you can, you you, you know, you can, you can do a blood test, but the blood test is only accurate if they're currently being exposed to it at high levels. If there's just a slow drip or they were exposed in the past and not being exposed now, or within a couple of days, they haven't been exposed. The blood levels are really low and you, you, you might say, well, they don't have lead toxicity or mercury toxicity. But if you do these provocation tests or a hair test, a hair test can be a more long-term test. That gives you the stores of these these metals in the body. So a provocation test is where you give somebody something to take that binds these metals so they can urinate it out. And then you check the urine for these levels. So you could do, first you do a urine test, you know, grab the urine before they take the provocation stuff. Then they take stuff either orally or injectable. Then you collect urine for a few hours afterwards and you compare them. Are the metal levels high in the second test versus the first test? And invariably, that's what we see. You know, high levels of lead and mercury coming out of people when we provoke them with giving them a chelator or a binder of something. You know, I've got a question to ask you. There was an article that came out in Medical Hypothesis in 2013, and I actually just posted it in my membership group. I now have Smart Plus Heart membership group, and you can learn about it at drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership. And... They took organic chickens and they first measured tap water, then they made bone broth with organic chicken bones, and then they measured the lead in the bone broth after they made it. And they found that there was significant increase of lead and no amount of lead is healthy. All amount of lead binds into your body. And I have since 2013 been extremely leery of bone broth. And I know how difficult it is to measure. And it's easy for a bone broth company to say we're free of metal toxins in our healthy bone broth. What do you think about that? Well, I can tell you from the the numbers of people that have high lead, so so lead, lead lead will primarily store in fat tissue and bone, and that's the body's way of trying to to mark it away. So if you get a, a fracture of a bone, like a big bone, you get a lot of lead released into the body, and we've tested that on people after bone fractures. We've seen it. There's been a couple of articles about that. Um, so you know, I share your concerns with bone broth, and you know, they can make all the statements they want that there's not metals in their bone broth. I find that hard to believe because I mean, I'm going to guess over 90% of people that we provocate, provoke test, have high lead levels. And it is, it's the norm, it's the abnormal one that doesn't, who has already been detoxed for it. Everybody has high lead levels. And whether these cows are fed organic or non-organic stuff, you know, lead is all over the place, still from leaded gasoline that we burned for so many years. Right. And when they, they... Um, take buildings down, lead is liberated into the air and it's in the dust. I have an entire chapter on lead 
in hormone deception because it's very hard to get out of the body and it depresses IQ. In children, lead makes kids not able to think as well. It's very, the higher the lead, even if it's very small, it's a metalloestrogen. So like a hormone, it works in parts yeah. per billion and trillion. So a tiny little bit lowers IQ. And when I brought these concerns up at an A4M conference, many people who are pro bone broth will say, oh, well, there's plenty of other minerals in bone broth. So they'll just help the body not absorb the lead, but that isn't how heavy metals work. The, unfortunately, the metals are really well absorbed. And luckily, we're designed to know that. And that's why the body tries to store them away in bones and fat tissue before it starts hitting, you know, the heart or the nervous system or other organs and, you know, other glands of the body. But it, it's a mess out there. And, um, you know, we're coming off four years of an administration that didn't see a pesticide or an insecticide or a heavy metal didn't like and rolled back all the environmental regulations that weren't enough for before that. And so, you know, we're going to see bigger problems with that coming up from what's happened the last four years and, and the, you know, the bigger pollution that we've been in, you know, for the last four years. So one of the reasons that you're on the show today is that you have a brand new book and I would love to, for, to have you explain why you wrote this book. And I don't know how much you want to get into the history and so forth. So I'm going to just have you take it away, bro, David. Well, here's the book. A Holistic and, Approach to Viruses for those of you that aren't on YouTube and are walking around with listening to the podcast. So the, um, well, I, I'll, I'll get into the history of the book because the book, you know, was certainly triggered by the COVID pandemic that we're, we're still struggling through. Um, you know, we, we, um, in my office, you know, we, when, when China released that information that three patients were suffering from an abnormal pneumonia, um, at the end of December in 2019, um, I followed that report and they thought there, they thought this was an unusual virus, a novel virus that, uh, um, came from bats. I think that's when the, the initial reports and they, said they had a typical pneumonia and they had immune system dysfunction and, you know, there was concern with that. So immediately every report followed from that I read. And, you know, a week later they were saying, you know, there's a few people now infected in Wuhan. And, you know, a week later there was more people infected. And then, you know, we all know the story and, you know, China locked down first and, you know, so on. So I was watching this and, you know, talking about it with my partners and, you know, as it, as January rolled on into February, you could feel the tension rise in patients and my staff. You know, the media was starting to promote more. The WHO released, you know, um, warnings and then, you know, the pandemic warming warnings and so on. And so I think the first cases in the U.S. were in California and Seattle in uh, February of 2020. And at that point, when it hit the West Coast of the U.S., it was only a matter of time until it well, there were two there were two factors involved there. It was either a matter of time until it went across the US or the US got down to business and contact traced and quarantined and aggressively went after these people who were sick, but we didn't do that. Um, so I felt it was only a matter of time until it came across the US and hit where I practice in Michigan. And so as the month of February went on, there were more cases reported on the West Coast and nursing homes and hospitals in Seattle were were being over, overblown with patients and people were dying now of it. And so I, I had a meeting with my staff at the end of February. And, you know, the warnings were dire at that point. The WHO had released its pandemic warming warnings and CDC was releasing statements every other day, um, you know, warning people that this was coming. Um, I think President Trump had closed, you know, flights from China, um, which was the right thing to do, but it should have been done earlier than that. Um, but, um, so, so I had a meeting with my staff and, you know, the tension in my office was enormous. Everyone was on edge. Um, and I was trying to talk to them individually and it was just, the fear was guiding everything. You could see it in their eyes. You can just feel it. And so I, at the meeting with my staff, right before that meeting with my staff, I was seating them in the waiting room in a meeting with my partners. And I said, you know, guys, this thing's coming. And I'm planning on staying up. I'm planning on seeing patients. I'm planning on helping them. We got a good treatment plan. Same plan we've been doing for 25 years for influenza-like illnesses. 
of using some oral vitamins and IV vitamin therapies. And over the 25 years, our patients didn't get pneumonia, didn't get hospitalized, didn't die anywhere near the rates of what should be, you know, the CDC was reporting. I mean, keep in mind every year, 20 to 80,000 Americans die from flu and flu-like illnesses. And if it's a bad year, it's in the hundreds of thousands who die from flu and flu-like illnesses. And our patients didn't do that. So I, you know, I was, we're talking with my partners and I said, hey, I'm gonna see patients. You know, I'm, I'm assuming we're staying open, right? And, you know, they're looking at me like, you know, are you crazy? You know, this is, I think we should close if this thing comes here. I'm like, guys, this is when our patients are gonna need us, you know? And they immediately flipped, you know, we, we talked about it right there and they're like, you know, you're right, we're gonna stay open, let's do this. And, you know, I said that, uh, you know, I'm working until I either I can't, either I get sick or they won't let me work. Um, now, I'm not the best patient for this illness, for any viral illness. I have no immunoglobulin A that about 1% of the population has. So I'm more prone to getting viral illnesses. Um, I have a 65 degree scoliotic curve with lung involvement in my left lung. And, you know, I don't have the greatest lung function. And I have severe asthma that I've had since a childhood. Now, I used to get colds and viruses all the time. And then once I cleaned up my diet and took the right, corrected some nutrient imbalances, that went away. And I'm like a normal person now where I get a cold or two a year. And, you know, they're minor things and I just get through them. And, you know, before I used to have to take steroids and inhalers and, you know, sometimes antibiotics. And I, I just don't do that anymore. Um, so then, you know, we go to the staff meeting. And the staff is just panicked. And I said, look, we've got we've got something to offer here. There's no, there's no medical treatment for coronavirus that we know of. And, you know, the, the reports out of China were dire. You know, the reports out of Italy were worse. Um, and um, I said, I don't see any reason why our patients and why we can't do well through this. Undoubtedly, we've treated coronavirus infection over the last 25 years because it, it encompasses about a third of influenza-like illnesses every flu season. Why should this one be any different? And I told them I can't guarantee that. This is a, a new strain of coronavirus, but there's new strains of flu every year. There's new strains of everything every year. And, you know, supporting the immune system is, has shown its worth that, you know, people, when they have a strong immune system, if, if they get exposed to any stressor, such as a virus or bacteria or, or any other stressor, they can, they, you know, we're designed to withstand that and overcome it and neutralize these pathogens. So we finished the meeting, you know, I'm like, oh boy, I think everyone's settled down now. And then you know, coronavirus hits Michigan a week later. And, you know, the first death is a few days later than that. And then, you know, I told my staff, anyone, I'm working. And if, if I have to work alone, I'll work alone. I said, but anyone who doesn't want to work, you know, no one's job's at risk here. Um, and I, we ended up working with about 50% of our staff. And we worked through the crisis. And so in March and April, when the worst times, because when a new virus comes, it's always bad at the beginning. You know, the, they're, they're more lethal at the beginning. Um, the susceptible are more likely to die at the beginning of any new viral pandemic or viral illness. And then viruses seem to settle down in rhythm with us. They'll, they come and go and, and, you know, viruses don't want to kill all of us because if they do, they're going to die. They, they need to keep their host alive. Um, but, you know, the, the deaths were huge at the beginning. You know, 88% of people ventilated, um, you know, were dying across the country. And, you know, we, the, there were trucks to get the extra bodies, you know, in New York City, and we all remember the reports. So we were treating patients. We were treating patients with an oral vitamin regimen, vitamin A, C, D, and iodine at high doses for four days. What was this the dose a, of iodine? This is exactly what we've done for 25 years. So the dose of vitamin A was 100,000 units of vitamin A daily for four days, not beta carotene, vitamin A. Vitamin D was 50,000 units a day for four days. Vitamin C was 1,000 milligrams an hour, you know, up to bowel tolerance, you know, while you're awake. And then iodine, most of our patients were on iodine because I've been using iodine for 20 plus years and checking iodine levels. So if they were on iodine, I just have them double whatever dose they were on for four days. And if they weren't on iodine, 25 to 50 milligrams, um, you know, a day for four days. And the the vast majority of patients did fine with that. Now, if, if things were a You're little talking bit about more, the vast majority of coronavirus 19 patients, yes. right. Okay. 
And just as the vast majority of our patients over 25 years with other flu-like illnesses did fine with that. The next step was we had them nebulize if they had any lung involvement, shortness of breath, coughing, you know, wheezing, anything like that. And so we had them nebulize a dilute solution of hydrogen peroxide and, and saline. And um, it, it came out to a 0.04% solution of hydrogen peroxide in a normal saline bag. And if things got worse or they weren't improving, then we had them come into the office um, for IVs of vitamin C, hydrogen peroxide, and intramuscular shots of ozone. Now, for 20, you know, it's been over 25 years. For the first 24 plus years, we'd have them come into the office and treat them. And, you know, we would be face to face with them, putting IVs in them and treating them without masks on, without gloves, without gowns. For this one, because this one, things were different, times were different. You know, we met them outside. And we would treat them out of their car and they'd roll down their window, put their arm out the car window and we'd pop an IV in them and do our thing. Now, remember in Michigan in March and April, it's not nice in March, especially. And there was snow, sleet, ice, you know, with 25 degree, 20 degree weather. And, you know, we were wearing full PPE gear um, and treating them. And, you know, this, you know, this has gone on since March. And, you know, this weekend I was there uh, yesterday doing two IVs in the middle of, you know, snow coming down on patients because, you know, they're still suffering from coronavirus. But, you know, I wrote a paper on this and for, I wrote a paper on my March and April escapades and we treated 107 patients. We had no deaths, two hospitalizations. And what was the median age of your patients? 50, uh, it's, it's, it's in my paper, but I'm, median age was like 57 or 58, something around there. Okay. Um, um, for some reason, my practice has grown older as I've grown older. I'm not quite certain. <laughs> Uh, they, were, they used to be young with me when, we, when I was young. But in 57, 58, we had, a, we had a fair number of people over the age of 70. And um, we had a couple of kids who skewed the numbers down a little bit. Um, so the median age was probably a little bit higher than that, especially if we removed those younger kids in there. But um, you know, our patients did well. The ones who were having trouble breathing when they, they started nebulizing hydrogen peroxide or getting the IVs would would leave me messages, you know, an hour or two later, you know, their the lungs are opening up. They, you know, I have story after story of um, people doing well. And, and, you know, I was blogging about it and writing, you know, posting interviews with patients as they were doing well, because at that point in March, February, and March, I mean, March and April, there was no good news coming out of anywhere. The media was death, 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 disaster, disaster, disaster. And there's nothing to do except, you know, the media was harping. You don't want to go to the emergency room. You don't want to be in a hospital because everyone's dying you know, stay home. And, um, you know, there was things to do. The things to do were to, number one, eat better. Number two, drink enough water. Number three, correct nutrient imbalances and, you know, take some natural therapies that help support the immune system. And, and they don't want to say this because they, they feel that there aren't randomized controlled trials on it, but there are so many clinical trials and there is so many scientific data that it seems to me to be a sin and a malpractice to not educate the public on what you're saying. Well, so the, you bring up the randomized controlled trials. So, so in the midst of this, I get a letter from the FTC telling me that I have 48 hours to take down all my blog posts on coronavirus, and especially the interviews. They hated the interviews I did with my patients. Basically, I was the interviewer. They were, they were telling their story about getting sick, you know, and I would just lead them. You know, when did you get sick? What were your symptoms? Did you go to your doctor? Did you, you know, what, whatever. And then we'd talk about, well, what did you do? You know, what did you do when you called me or my partners and you got sick? And um, the, for whatever reason, I get a four page back to front bulleted detailed description of what they don't like. They said, you know, these weren't interviews. These were advertisements for my practice. Um, and they gave me 48 hours to remove them right here from the U.S. Justice Department. Um, so we removed them and I haven't blogged since then. You know, I've still been treating patients and, you know, we're still getting the good results still. And, you know, what I, what I found out in the interim after spending a lot of money and hiring a first amendment lawyer that, um, this has first amendment protection. Your book. Now, how does your book have first amendment protection? Because books have first amendment protection in the United States, but I don't. So free speech isn't alive and well censorship is alive and well. And so books, you can say anything you want in a book, but you can't say anything you want. Like we might be at risk by having this show right now. 
well, I didn't say anything I wanted in the book. I cited it all with medical research and, okay. and you know, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, flouting, you know, craziness out there. But um, could this show be censored by the FTC? Sure, it could. And you know, I put up, um, I know you don't use any of the uh, medicines that maybe shouldn't be named, but there is a frontline COVID alliance. I interviewed one of the docs, their emergency and ICU docs that have been trying to find a way to repurpose older inexpensive meds. And I just put a link to a meta-analysis of 28 studies showing that this medication was efficacious for COVID and all of these. And I got, that was taken down by Facebook. And I got a text from Facebook saying that if I published another um, another post on ways to treat this illness, that I would be banned from Facebook for life. We can't mention the medication. Well, I'm going to now mention it soon. But uh, you know, they. I, it's funny how I've been now a little bit reluctant to mention it, but it's ivermectin. You know, I know the feeling. <laughs> um, so, well, we never. You know, it's interesting. We never use hydroxychloroquine. We never use ivermectin. Um, we've just never used any of those things because we didn't have to. Our patients did fine when we supported their immune system up. You know, you brought up randomized controlled trials. In the in the FTC letter, they comment, they made a statement that, you know, um, there's no trial, there's no um, studies showing what you say is true. Therefore, you can't say it. And if you have 48 hours to remove your things or you're here from the U.S. Justice Department. So I... I wrote my study up. That's that prompted me to write the study and and this. Your uh, book. And so I wrote the study up. My wife was a lawyer, was in contact with the FTC gentleman who wrote the letter. And she sent him another letter saying, now we have a study. It's a it's a peer-reviewed study in a you know in a journal. So we want to post the study on our website without comment. And they said, no, it's not a randomized controlled trial. Unbelievable. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I penned another letter. Unbelievable. Now, remember, this was April of 2020. COVID had been around for about eight weeks or so, give or take. And I, I penned a letter saying, how can there be a randomized controlled trial of a new illness that w- hasn't been around? And the only thing we're going to have are clinical trials. The only thing we're going to do are do what you say. With ivermectin, there's, there's other clinical trials that say, hey, this may work. And if, there if, were randomized trials for it against other dengue theater uh Sure. HIV, so many other viruses for but the last was, 20 years. But there was no randomized trials against COVID-19, COVID-19. or uh, SARS-CoV-2. And um, and there's no randomized trial for anything for SARS-CoV-2 in March and April in the United States. And um, now there's only a couple of them, but, um, you know, that's that's the world we live in right now. And, and like you said, you're a little skittish about, you know, your words and what you're saying. I'm totally feeling it. You know, the... the um, you know, we, we, we changed our website around. under. I the, saw that. I went when I was looking in your website to gather some information to present you in the way that you should be presented because you're really a, a national resource. I saw that you had changed your website to kind of deal with what we're talking about. So we've changed our website and I'm, I'm you know, I don't know what to do about blogging anymore. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of my head's spinning right now thinking, do I want to start blogging again? And we, 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 I'm at that point right now where I could start blogging, but I'm, I'm leery about it right now because of the, the times we live in the, it's almost like we're in book burning times with Nazi Germany where you can, the the government will tell you what you can talk about, what you can't talk about. You know, uh, um, when I first heard in um, middle of March, we had a meeting in the clinic where I work at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine the first week in February, and we knew things were coming down the pike. And then I saw an article out of Wuhan that people who didn't have any symptoms, when they had CT scans of their lungs, it showed ground glass opacity, so lung damage without symptoms. So I thought, oh my God, this is a novel virus. So I dove deep to write the article that I wrote, the blog that I wrote. And there was so much data on vitamin A, vitamin D. One of the people in my, that's a member of my membership is in dietitian school. They tell them they'll lose their, their license if they ever recommend any dose of vitamin A. They say you can't recommend vitamin C because if you have the chemical in your blood that Eric 
Bradovich uh, uh, found, which is no longer in most of us, that will make some kind of carcinogen. So nobody should be given A or C. So they're warned in dietitian school. Yet we're saying, uh, um, I had in the second half of that article, nutrients to take and 200 citations, but I had to bury it. I made the title of that blog so convoluted that I still have people not able to find it because I don't want a letter from the FTC. Trust me, you don't want a letter from the FTC. Um, it's very anxiety provoking, very, was, you know, it was the first time in my life. I remember when I, I walked in the door after working 12 hour day. Look, we had, I've never worked harder since March of 2020. I'm, I haven't worked this hard since my residency. And, you know, we're outside after hours in the parking lot doing IVs on people and on weekends. And um, th th this is by far the most time I put into medicine. And, you know, COVID, it's interesting, COVID to me and to my partners has been the most exciting, exhilarating, rewarding, miserable, anxiety provoking, um, upsetting time in medicine all rolled into one ball. And part of the miserable time period is just the censorship where you can't talk about anything. And the, the, it's just, it's just terrible right now. And I, I don't know how it's going to end. And, you know, we need, we need folks to speak up about it and just say, you know, they want to hear about these things. And, we can't talk about ivermectin and hydroxy. Look, does hydroxychloroquine work for COVID-19? I don't know. I don't use it. That's not part of my treatment. Do I think we should be able to talk about it? And doctors have been able to use things off label forever. And now all of a sudden, you know, I get, I get an email from the governor of the state of Michigan at the beginning of coronavirus saying, if you prescribe hydroxychloroquine for a viral illness, um, your license is at risk. See, this is crazy. So did you have any issues with the board or what's going on with the Michigan Medical Board? Well, that, that's that's being settled right now. Um, so had had some issues with them. I think that's gone OK. I think that's I'll what did they say to you? And why why did you have an issue? Was it did the FTC contact them or what? Happened? I don't know who contacted them, um, but it was the same. It was virtually the same complaint. It was it was those videos. It was the interviews with the patients and it was false claims for covid. What false I told, claims, and here you're getting your patients well, and you even published What I told them was there's no false claims about it. I mean, this is what I was doing. This is what I was reporting. This is the peer-reviewed paper I put in. This is what the book that I wrote. And there's no false claims. Now, you could say maybe it's not efficacious. Maybe it doesn't work. But it wasn't nothing false about it. And, you know, we've got testimonial after testimonial about how patients have done better with it. And I just, yesterday, I did, I did an IV parking lot. It was snowing. Um, you know, I, I got a face mask on and, and uh, a mask and a shield on. And I remember shaking my head to try and clear the snow so I can see where the vein is. And he was having chest pain, a little bit of shortness of breath, and do the IV on him. And I send him home with the nebulized peroxide. He, I called him up a couple hours later and he said, I said, how are you feeling? He goes, well, chest pain's gone. And he goes, I'm not short of breath anymore. He goes, I think it went away about a half an hour after my drive home. Um, <laughs> From your from your parking lot, and he said when I did the first nebulized treatment, whatever little bit was there, because he said most of it had gone, was gone, and you know those are the things we're hearing from our patients, and um, you know these therapies are safe, they've proven their worth to us over 25 years, and you know there there's they should be studied just like everything else, but we should be able to talk about it. I mean. You know, without this is just so crazy. I don't understand it at all because we have almost 400,000 Americans dying and it, we haven't even hit a higher peak. So Renfield just is, you know, stepping down from the CDC and he says, we're, we haven't hit the highest peak yet. And we're seeing 4,000 people die a day. And yet they don't want to discuss these things. The Cleveland Clinic uh, went through a database of their patients of approximately 30,000 patients. And they called them up. They said, did you get COVID? Who got it? Who didn't? The patients who, who didn't get it were on melatonin. A few days later, Columbia University published if their intubated patients with COVID were given melatonin, they didn't have the same lung scarring. So why can't we talk about melatonin? Like it's a sensible thing to get on board in your pharmacopoeia, in your home. I just don't understand that because oh. what we're doing isn't working. So it's, it's interesting. Henry Ford Hospital, which is a huge system in Detroit, uh, in the Detroit area, and they're very conventional. They're, there's nothing alternative with Henry Ford Health Systems. They did a study on hydroxychloroquine, and they found 50% reduction in mortality rate for those given hydroxychloroquine who are hospitalized. And so they published it. Um, the I don't know who it was from Henry Ford, uh, the CEO or somebody from Henry Ford, asked the 
FDA for permission to study it further and to get a get a use authorization for hydroxychloroquine. And the FDA declined. And th- why can't we study this? They had a 50% mortality drop with it. You know, in, in the middle of March, France had already had their Mersai study. And in the Mersai study, because France knew that COVID was coming. So they had the Mersai study where they had three different levels of patients, one that were treated the way they normally treat upper respiratory viral patients. And then they gave them um, hydroxychloroquine. And then they gave them hydroxychloroquine with Zithromax and zinc, which are also antiviral replicators. And in the third group, within a week, they had a reduction of viral load by 95%. So that was published then. So why, and so at our clinic, we started using hydroxychloroquine. We've treated about 75 patients. At first, it was with the nutrients you're saying, plus hydroxychloroquine. Lately, we've added ivermectin instead. One of our doctors, Dr. Maristani, called up the pharmacist that we use, Creative Pharmacy, and said, you're saving people's lives fulfilling these hydroxychloroquine because none of our patients have had to go to the hospital. They're older demographic. So we have now almost 80 patients, I guess, and they've all done well. And yet we can't talk about this. I'm fearful that our discussion right now is going to perhaps put into risk all of my other historical work. It's crazy. And people aren't going to benefit that they should benefit to protect themselves? I took down 20 plus years of blogging and information and articles. You know, when I got that letter from the FTC. 20 plus years you had to take down? I I didn't have to take it all down, but I was, I got scared. And, you know, I'm not, look, I'll retire on my own terms. I don't need them to tell me when I want to (laughs) retire and I'm not ready to retire yet. I like what I do. And, um, you know, I don't want to retire, especially in these times when, you know, there's, you know, everyone's still scared and everyone's, you know, the COVID is still out there and still, um, you know, I think that being treated correctly. And I think, you know, look, until conventional medicine realizes people need a strong immune system for this. They like they need it for everything else. And this vaccine that they're touting as the cure-all, first off, we'll see. I was hoping that it is. But the vaccine doesn't work if the immune system doesn't work. You need a healthy immune system to respond to the vaccine. So I don't quite understand why conventional medicine isn't focusing on getting them, get their immune system as strong as they do before they get the vaccine so they can respond appropriately to the vaccine. So what do you recommend it, if you can give us a little bit of a summary, but we want people to get your book, The Holistic Approach to Viruses, uh, which you can get at Dr. Um, Brownstein's website. He's going to give you that information. Plus, we'll have the links to all of this in the write-ups. But if you could summarize for us the to-dos for a healthy immune system. Well, number one, it's it's you shouldn't take any of these supplements, you know, and ivermectin, uh, hydroxychloroquine, any of it, without working with a holistic doctor can monitor you. That's number one. So if you don't have a holistic doctor, it's time to find one. If your doctor's not talking to you about how to support your immune system, time to find one that is. Because if this wasn't, you know, an indication of what's wrong with our country, I don't know what is. You know, we're 5% of the world's population. We have something like, I don't know what it is, 35% of the world's deaths from coronavirus. You know, it's way out of proportion to what our world's population is. And, um, you know, this, this, this illness is our wake up call. That's why I titled the last chapter in the book. I almost titled the book that title, you know, this is our wake up call. And, you know, we finished last on every health indicator from the world health organization, from neonatal mortality to maternal mortality, um, you know, at, at birth to, um, you know, longevity We're we're last every Western country is ahead of us. And yet we spend over twofold more on our GNP than any other Western country. And we're so arrogant and we're shutting up people that have natural and expensive answers. What the heck? So we, we were clearly moving down the wrong path. And this was just exemplified what's been going on over the last 30, 40 years. And either we, either we make a course correction, such as having a Manhattan Project you know, for this, for people's immune systems, or wait till the next coronavirus comes, wait till the next uh, RSV virus comes, whatever it is. And then, you know, there's other viruses that are going to come. What shocked me most about this one was why it took so long in my career to see one. I was expecting one, you know, years before this that would, you know, spread like wildfire and, and injure and kill too many people because our immune systems are in such bad shape. You know, two thirds of us are obese. Um, I'm sorry, two thirds of us are overweight. One third of us are obese. And we have more type two diabetes than we know what to do with. You know, I don't have to go on about our poor health, but, you know, so what do you do? Now, you know, number one, you got to, eat a healthy diet. And, you know, the, the standard American diet is not healthy. It's too much sugar. 
It's too many refined carbohydrates. I was talking with my partner the other night after working a long day, and I said to him, you know, Rick, if people just cut the sugar out of their diet, um, cut anything with refined sugar out of their diet, we wouldn't be in this mess we're in right now. And I'm like, you know, we'd see, we, we'd see healthier patients and thinner patients. So we, we eat too much sugar. And all you have to do is just look at labels. If there's added sugar, just don't eat that food. You know, uh, um, there's a, a, a growing link between vitamin D levels and vulnerability to COVID and high fructose corn syrup blocks the body's ability to utilize vitamin D from the sun. Absolutely. And, and um, so just cut out sugar in your diet. That's an easy thing to do. The, other, the next easy thing in diet wise is cut out refined carbohydrates, you know, breads, pasta, cereals, and just eat whole foods, eat whole foods. And if you're going to eat, you know, animal foods, eat organic animal foods. Um, and, you know, after cleaning up the diet, then the next step to having a healthy immune system is drink enough water and maintain hydration. You know, one of the things that quickly lands you in the emergency room is if you're dehydrated, and you get sick with something, you go down really fast and really hard. So it's important to maintain hydration. Third step to having a healthy immune system is exercise. It, people have to move and exercise stimulates the innate and the adaptive immune systems. Um, white blood cells function better during exercise. And you know, now and I'm mentioning white blood cells. Um, I'm gonna turn back for a second here and tell you, if you eat refined sugar, there's been animal studies that show White blood cells become paralyzed for up to five hours after you yep. eat refined sugar. Yep. So how do you expect to overcome coronavirus or whatever other virus or bacteria if your white blood cells are paralyzed because you're eating too much refined sugar? I just got to make a comment on that. I'm sorry, but um, I used to write, I used to have a full page in the San Francisco Chronicle in the health section, and I did a whole expose on sugar when that article came out. It first came out a long time ago, and I said, long look at it. it. And um, so I wrote about how we're headed for uh, an epidemic of illness and obesity because of the sugar in our diet. So my editor, uh, Michael Bauer, called me and he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is great article, great article. The bad news is you're fired. Turned out that CNH Sugar was San Francisco Chronicle's number one um, advertiser. So anyway, this has been known, and yet medical doctors, with all their arrogance, many of them are not saying to patients right at the first visit, "Look, at if you really want to be healthy, you got to give up refined foods and sugars." What the I heck? think that I think that article was in the seventies, wasn't it? Uh, it was really. A, I think I was writing in the seventies. That's when it was. We've been I'm around for that a article while. In the 70s. I am pretty <laughs> sure. You know, I, I referenced that article in. My both the book and the paper that I got published. Right, and Alan Gaby references it in his nutritional medicine. I mean, we've all been saying this for so long, but people tend to want to eat processed foods and sit in their favorite chair in front of the TV and then get, you know, I can't believe I've been watching the news so much lately, the the medical commercials. Why, where's the American Medical Association stopping these commercials? Yep. No other country does this. So we're set up to have a poor response to COVID. Yeah, and so that that's, so instead of naming the book this title, it was going to be named the last chapter, which was, uh, oh, I got to give you the name. I, I said it. Um, you just said um, a wake up call. You just this said is a wake, a wake up, up call. That right. was going to be the title of the book. I was 50 50 on it. And, um, you know, I just chose the holistic approach to viruses at the end. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, with this new administration coming in, you know, he's already. <laughs> I mean, he was already promoting this this COVID treatment thing and this contact tracing. You know, I wish he would promote a Manhattan plan for we need to teach Americans how to eat better and, and you know why it's so important to cut sugar out of your diet. Why do dietitians not take up why why are they so snooty about nutritionists and the nutrition coming out of holistic doctors? Why is it that this sensible, common sense approach to eating and health just is not um pushed for, forward by the people that say that they own that part of medicine. You know, it's the same reason the doctors don't talk about it. They're not taught about it. They don't know about it. And it's taught negatively in their schooling. I have a few as patients. I have a few as friends. Um, I would say, and I'm going to estimate here for dietitians, 95% um, of dietitians are, they just don't know about how to support the body. And, you know, they just put the party line. And um, my daughter, who's in her residency right now, said that a they had a dietitian come talk to them about um, giving nutrition to um, um, cachectic, you know, um, sick patients. And um, sick people are patients. losing a lot of weight. So she yeah. brought in a can of um, 
what's that protein? It's 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 sold over the counter. Oh, Ensure. Ensure. Yeah. So she reads the labels from Ensure and she says to the group, well, this has 20 grams of protein or something like that in there. So my daughter said after the lecture, the can was up there and she went and looked at the can. I believe now, and this is my, I can't remember exactly how much sugar was in there, but I believe she said there were 39 grams of sugar in this can of Ensure. Now a can of Coke and has- Some of this high fructose corn syrup that deactivates vitamin D, right? A can of Coke, I think, has 30 grams of sugar in it. So basically with this Ensure can, you're getting a can of Coke plus amounts of sugar in it. Now, how in the hell can that be good for anyone, much less an old person who's standing and not eating? Um, it's not good for anybody. And, um, you know, why would that be in something? And it's just mind-blowing to me, you know, what's happened. And, you know, in my medical training, what I remember from my four years at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, um, oh, and you went, to, did you go to University of Michigan in pre-med and then you went to medical school at Wayne State? Is that what you yep, did? Yeah, that, okay. that was my, that was my rotation. Okay. And um, what I remember in medical school, um, now Wayne State at that point was a top 20 medical school in the country. You know, we, it was, it was up there and we had three hours of nutrition. And at that point in my training, I was just a conventional doc. I was a conventional medical student. I didn't take any vitamins. I didn't grow up on a holistic household. I didn't think that way, you know. I, I used to like my McDonald's, my quarter pounder without cheese and large Coke and fries. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, of course I was suffering from asthma and I was taking inhalers all the time. My nose was always stuffed up. Um, and you know, I was puffing an inhaler like a, like a, oh, I always, I always had them on me. Now I don't even puff. I don't have one. I have them, but I don't even, if I have to use an inhaler, I have to search for it because I don't know where it is. But so I remember the three hours of nutrition. Now there was something in me that, I was intrigued about the three hour nutrition because they brought in some guest lecturer to do it. So in those three hours, because I looked back on this years later when I became a holistic doctor, I pulled the notes out. And what they talked about was scurvy is vitamin C, severe vitamin C deficiency is a thing of the past. Um, Beriberi is thiamine deficiency and it causes congestive heart failure and edema and neurologic problems. And it was common in... um, prisoners of war and world in Japan and world war II, And it's a thing of the past. Um, it was all these things of the past and they, you know, iodine deficiency caused goiter. Um, and it was corrected by iodized salt. It's a thing of the past. And that was it. And our, and our test, I had a copy of the test was basically scurvy is, you know, vitamin C deficiency, thi- uh, beriberi is diamond deficiency. Um, so, you know, when I look back on those notes, by three hours, I would say two hours, 56 minutes and change. And so we're kind of wasted. And there was maybe three minutes or so in there on diet. And it wasn't much, but it did talk about how we were becoming heavier. This was in the 1980s and that we need to eat more like the food pyramid. And of course, the food pyramid was high in those refined carbohydrates. But you know, people, this is such an important point. People, Everything always ends with go ask your doctor before you do anything. So you go ask your doctor and realize when you ask your doctor, my candidate for vitamin D is melatonin really going to be helpful for me with COVID. They probably had the three hours of nutrition or if maybe fast forward four or five hours of nutrition. That's all they've had. And you're asking that doctor that is not a person of authority to answer that question. You have to really understand the truth of this because that is the reality. Now you just misspoke. You said five to six hours of nutrition. That's not true. I have two children who are one really, child. They, just, it hasn't gone up to five or six by now. It's still at three. I have one child who just finished medical school and one who's got a few <laughs> months left to finish. They got about the same amount of nutrition stuff that I got. It was almost nothing. And it was it was less than five or six hours. And that is enough to make me hypertensive. I am it's, sorry. It's the same thing that they're getting. And, and they're so arrogant. I can't stand it. And so, so it's funny, you know, I hear them going through their training and I, you know, I promised them I wouldn't write about this stuff because, you know, I'm not, I can't get them in trouble. And, you know, they tell me stories all the time about, you know, when doctors try and talk about nutrition, they're just tongue tied. They, they don't really know. So there's a few and the few who know she's she they've told me they have to study it because we didn't get it in medical school. I had to train myself. I had to go back and learn and read and study biochemistry. And, you know, we take enough biochemistry in medical school. We should understand the value of these nutrients and you know how they support the immune system and so on. Nutrients and hormones are main signaling molecules. Absolutely. Can we go back to your a list of improving the immune system? 
just look at the biochemical pathways. You'll see all the cofactors that's needed to to produce thyroid hormone or to produce, you know, adrenal hormone or, or anything. And um, why we don't understand that. And it's interesting with COVID, you know, so ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, we're repurposing all these old drugs. We don't, we shouldn't have to repurpose a drug. There's other countries, I can tell you these other countries, these poor countries, they ain't using, they ain't using stuff like that. Um, maybe they're using hydroxychloroquine because it's cheap, but I don't really think that's why they're having less illness than we are. I think they're having less illness because their population isn't as fat and isn't as heavy and isn't as sick. And they're not in so many pharmaceutical medications that we're on that are poisoning enzymes and blocking receptors and setting us up for problems. And, you know, this is why this should be. Our that is a problem. huge, you're just saying there, we, the average American, I'd like to know what you think is the average amount of drugs they take. And many of these drugs rinse out nutrients and poison enzymes and put them that you're treating one thing, but you're leaving the patient at a weakened condition. And then COVID comes. And as a country, we have a poorer response. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's mind blowing to me. We're spending all this money and, you know, Nine billion dollars on vaccines, and we don't know if they work or not. That was what the start was. I mean, we don't know if they're now. going to address the mutations. Yeah. Well, so I have a question for you. Um, Lancet just came out. Lancet, very prestigious medical journal. Although you can speak to some of the ex-editors, and they're pretty upset with Lancet lately. But um, Lancet just published one of the very largest studies on long COVID. Another name for that is long hauler syndrome. People who tend to have prolonged symptoms months after they get the initial illness, and it doesn't seem to be related to the severity of the initial illness. In your patients that you're treating naturally or the holistic approach to viruses are using long COVID. So we, I have a few patients who have long-term symptoms. Now, no, this may be just a small sample size. But, you know, they're talking about a third of people, I think, having long-term symptoms. We're not seeing that at all. And, you know, I, I'm in contact with the ones that have had long-term symptoms. They're they're able to work. They're able to, you know, function. They're not in bed. They're not disabled. Um, you know, when we've, when we've aggressively utilized, like, ozone and IV vitamin C, and actually high-dose melatonin is one of those things that seems to help them. And then, you know, the, there's other things. There's, you know, getting their structure realigned, getting, you know, again, cleaning up the diet, keeping sugar down in their diet. Our patients don't seem to function from it as severe as what they case, what the numbers they're reporting are. Yeah, the num let me just go through this because this, this was a study that came out in Lancet. It just came out. It was based on um, 1,733 patients with the average age of 57. It came out of Wuhan because Wuhan, you know, that's where the first showed up. So now they have some of the first patients with long COVID and articles coming out. New York had a huge um, vulnerability and fatality response to COVID. So Mount Sinai has now opened up a long COVID uh, clinic, and they also have a registry that you can go to and register and let them know if you're having these issues. But in this study from Wuhan that was published in Lancet, out of these almost 2,000 patients, 76% within six months, these are all patients who were hospitalized, only if they were hospitalized. So we don't know how much the treatment versus the disease contributes to this. But 76% still had one or more symptoms. 63% had fatigue and muscle weakness. 26% had insomnia. 23% reported anxiety and depression. And a significant number of people had lung abnormalities. And um, with imaging and some Texas physicians this last week published that they're seeing worse lung imaging than smokers with a lot of COVID patients, even those that are asymptomatic. So do you know how the lung imaging has been and the lung health of your patients that you did natural interventions with? Well, the good news is most of our patients weren't hospitalized. I mean, we had very few hospitalized, so I didn't. None you know, of ours were in, so, in, in Florida. So so perhaps either I have a small sample size, perhaps my treatments worked, perhaps whatever, you know, the, so I, I can't speak to that, but I can tell you the anxiety, the, the shortness of breath, the chest pain, the brain fog, those were pretty much the big things that I saw in people, the vast majority of those go away. And um, it sometimes takes a little bit of time, takes a little bit of, you know, adjusting nutritional things. But I'll tell you, the IV therapies have really helped a lot of patients with that. And, um, you know, by the time, you know, 
just when I was when I was blogging about it and I was blogging about I kept titling the blog post. There is still hope out there. Number one, number two, number three, number four. As I was interviewing patients, it was in the 20s before they made me take it all down. But I started getting calls from doctors in New York and New Jersey. And the, the, the three big hotspots, four big hotspots in the, in the United States in March and April were Michigan, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts at that time. And I'm getting calls from doctors in all those hospitals who are working saying, how do we nebulize? You know, how do we do this? And I get a call from a doctor at the hospital I trained at, who's uh, the chief intensivist. And he said, I want to use your peroxide um, nebulizing on in the ICU. And I said to him, I think that's, we could try that. I said, but why don't we try when they hit the ER? As soon as they hit the ER, put them on, you know, as the doctor's talking to them, they could be nebulizing. And I said, we see dramatic results with people improving. And, you know, they just tried it in the ICU. He didn't call me back. So I'm assuming it didn't work, but I don't know. Um, I heard from doctors in New York and I, I remember one of the doctors was an anesthesiologist and all she was doing was intubating patients, putting them on vents and watching them die, as she told me on the phone. And I said to her, hey, there was just this report of this 26-year-old young man who died of COVID. It was headlines in the New York Times. Was that, that was your hospital? And she goes, oh yeah, I intubated him. I said, how does a 26-year-old die of you know, a viral illness, a viral pneumonia illness? And she goes, well, what they're not telling you is that these young people that are dying in, in our hospital, they're all vaping. And she said, that guy, that guy was a high vapor and, you know, had been vaping for years. And she said, the lungs from the vapors look like they've been smoking for 30, 40 years. And she said, they don't respond well at all. So that's what they found in Wuhan was that men were affected more and especially smokers because it affects the ACE receptors in the lungs and it makes them so much more susceptible to the S protein, you know, hooking on in there. I had a few of those doctors tell me they couldn't tell the difference in the lungs between heavy smokers for decades and young people would vape for a couple years. Oh my God. That is really important information to get out. I'm glad you brought that up, David. So, so perhaps, you know, that's another, you know, vaping is just, you know, how the FDA allowed those vaping and the CDC allowed those vaping devices to go over the market without proper studying. And it's still over the market now. It's still out there is beyond me. And, you know, I see these young people that are like when they, go to college or they're coming home from college, you know, they come see me. I ask them, are you vaping? I'm just amazed at these being college educated young people. They're all vaping with uh, control their anxiety can, you know, whatever to get high, I guess, from the nicotine in them. I, I don't know what it gets you, but you know, this vaping is not benign and this vaping is a big problem and COVID ex- exploited this problem, unfortunately. So let me ask you a question. So uh, Johns Hopkins has come out with, um, in uh, one of their departments, they've been noting that there is an increase in younger people that get COVID, even if they get a mild case, with POTS disease. And they're saying that we're seeing it more. We're not seeing that with any of our patients in Naples. You're not seeing it. I don't know if there's a difference in the way that there's our intervention, but could you comment on that? And can you comment about POTS illness, which now Mayo Clinic says before COVID was happening to one out of every 100 young teenage girls in America? So postural orthopedic, was it? Orthostatic. Orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Right. they, they They get this blood pressure that drops really low when they stand up or try and do something. They can't perfuse well and they're, they're tired all the time. And look, I never saw POTS when I was training. God um, is, and the increase now. And now you see it in teenagers. You see it in young. So, so why are we seeing so much POTS now? I can tell you I've seen enough people who, enough teenagers who are getting POTS after a vaccination, particularly the HPV vaccine. And I've seen a bunch of them report sometime, some short time period after the HPV vaccine, usually the second or third one or the second one, you know, particularly that they're developing POTS. And now I, I have, I have one patient who never got vaccinated and she's got POTS. Um, but I've had a couple of people with, I've had a couple, two patients with COVID who developed POTS after COVID. And, you know, we've, we've managed most of the symptoms with that, with, you know, simply increasing salt in their diets and increasing water and, you know, using some adrenal support. And over time period, the POTS seems to get better. But, you know, POTS is this new diagnosis that I didn't see 30 years ago in my training. And all of a sudden now it's routine. You know, why are we having, you know, this should be studying that Manhattan Project for nutrition to see what's wrong with our young people. Why are they so sick? 
you know. Why are are young people so sick for such a wealthy country, for a country with so much money of our gross national product going to healthcare, with such arrogant healthcare providers? Why do we have a population that's so vulnerable and our children, all of our parents are saying, what is going on with our children? And you know what, Lindsay, either we fix this with our kids Forget the rest. China can wait us out. They, they don't have to go to war with us. They don't have to monetarily come after us or anything like that. They can just wait up our wait out our health. And this young population is too, going to be too sick to take care of us when we get old. And we have a, you know, that's the freight train of disaster coming in our country. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a few reasons, I think, for this. But, you know, it's either... Can you we, summarize in, those, please? Well, I think that Um, number one, back to eating healthy diets and exercise and drinking water and, you know, doing all that basic stuff. Um, I think this vaping thing is a disaster for them. They're on too many medications. They're, you know, we got young people on antidepressants, a third of girls, I think are taking some antidepressant right now below 18 years old. Um, I think we're giving them too many vaccines at too early of an age, um, for the life of me, I can't see why we're going to give someone a hepatitis B vaccine at the first day of birth if the mom doesn't have hepatitis B. Um, and, you know, th- that's just one example. But, you know, the the <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things. We can do that in another show. But I think, you know, we are the most vaccinated country on the face of the earth. And we have the most we have the sickest kids on the face of the earth. Now, you know, you- one other thing that people don't think about, though, is we give kids phones all the time and they always got their head down. And I've been talking to some pediatricians here in town with that head position and always being Velcroed to the phone. What that does is it alters the way they breathe so that there's asymptomatic apnea in younger and younger kids that's linked to fatty liver. So then they develop insulin resistance and all kinds of metabolic issues. Really, you don't think of this from the position of chronic being addicted to your phone and your, your pad. What about, what about the stress of being on the phone and the stress of, you know, you know, there, there's that Netflix show um, on the cell phones. I can't think of the name of it. Um, I haven't seen that one. Oh my God. It's so, it's so depressing. So they have the developers <laughs> of the, iPhone on there who have all retired and they're all like wealthy multimillionaires. They're I want young. to date one of them. Okay. <laughs> they're, in their, they're in their 30. So you oh, okay. can't them. do that. I'd be in but, trouble. <laughs> but um, so they, they were saying how they knew when they put the beeps in there and the, the responses the phones are making that it triggers endorphin release in the brain and they get addicted. Right, to- dopamine. It's very dopamine related. You get reward, reward, reward. I'm not getting off this phone. Well, this beeps, is my source. Well, beeps, they tell you there's a message. We all look at our phone. My phone's sitting over here. Right. You know, when it beeps, you know, my head turns this way. And, you know, they, they knew they did that. They knew these were addicting. They tried different beeps and different sounds and, and until they realized which ones are going to trigger that release. And now they regret it. And one of them, he's got- Now little- they regret it? That's what they said? They all, all four of these people that were profiled on this show said they regret it. And one of them, he, he must have been mid-30s or late 30s or something. He's got kids around 10 years old. And they, the interviewer asked him, are you, are you going to give your kids cell phones? No. For as long as I can do it, no. Our, you know, my kids are not getting this. And, you know, he, he, it, was, it was a really interesting show where, you know, um, you know it's, it's cell phones and computers. I mean, look, these kids, when we were kids... We didn't have that stuff. We, we were went outside. outside. We went outside. We, we didn't, didn't have outside. to go back till dinner time. Vitamin D. They don't run. They don't play. They don't think. They, they're just tied to these electronics. And so let me just go back to your treatment one more time. You have four days of these really high dosages. And now what does the person do after those four days? They've been on, you know, because they're scared. They, they hear 100,000 oh. units of vitamin A and they ask their doctor that had three hours of nutrition education. <laughs> and they go, that's nuts. That's nuts. You're going to get toxicity from that. Which So address that for a second. And then can you tell me yeah. what you recommend after the first four days? So vitamin, look, anything could be toxic in too large a doses. You can get too much water and be toxic. Um, but four days of vitamin A dosing, assuming someone's not toxic going into that, shouldn't be toxic for anybody. Those are adult dosing. And I, in my book, I have pediatric levels, um, vitamin D 50,000 units a day for four days. A and D are, are fat soluble vitamins. They can be toxic. Look, I, I've, I've been, I've been checking vitamin D levels since 1992, vitamin A levels since about 1995 and supplementing people with these things. If there was toxicity, I would see these levels. These, you I don't have, see that. 
We just don't see it, right? Vitamin C is not toxic. It's a water soluble vitamin, and and iodine you can have an allergy to it, but it's it's not a you know there's there's not a toxicity with that dose either. And um, so they take those for four days. Whole, majority of patients got better just doing that. And then, um, you know, we had them nebulize peroxide and iodine. Now, I, I did have in COVID because there was all this lung involvement. Unlike other flu-like illnesses, I would just do the oral stuff and then use the nebulizing if they developed lung problems. With COVID, I really put them on that from the beginning. And they were nebulizing a dilute solution of hydrogen peroxide and iodine. Um, so do they buy a home nebulizer or how do they do that? So they would buy a nebulizer and, and, you know, either mix up the solution themselves or we mix it up for them. And they would just draw off the solution and put it in the nebulizer and breathe it for a couple of minutes. If they were sick, you know, symptomatic, I would have them do it every, every waking hour till they felt better and then sort of wean down off the, you know, off it. And um, then, then we resort to doing the IV therapies if things got worse um, and, you know, meet them outside and, and do that. And, um, you know, it's, it's the therapy has proved it's worth over 25 plus years. And it's certainly, it's, it, it reacted this, it, it affected people the same way during COVID as it did for the other illnesses. So my prediction that, you know, I haven't treated COVID yet. I don't know how our patients are going to do, but I don't see any why it's any different than any viral illness that we've been exposed to. And we've certainly been exposed to other coronaviruses over the last 25 plus years that I've been treating patients, um, you know, played out and, you know, look, I expect we, we have an immune system for a reason. We have an innate and an adaptive immune system put out there so we can survive these things. If we didn't have this stuff, humans would be extinct long, long ago. You know, we're, we're made to survive these viruses. And um, if it's not, look at this year's coronavirus, next year may be a different one. And it's going to be a different one. And it, there's going to be a different one in the year after that. Um, so the, the point is, you can wait for the vaccine. You can wait for, you know, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or have a strong immune system and hopefully not have to rely on, you know, anything but your, your body. That's, that's how we were designed to function with these things. Um, and I don't see any reason why we can't support it. And, you know, it makes common sense to me. It makes biochemical sense. And, you know, if you're not finding a doctor that's working with you to support your immune system, then find one that can. So I have one other question. Well, actually, I might have more than that. But um, you hadn't mentioned in your protocol melatonin. Do you recommend melatonin? One of the things I was really struck by was an article that said one of the reasons bats don't get these viruses that they harbor is that they're nocturnal and they have the highest level tissue levels of melatonin of any organism on the planet. And melatonin has been now thought of as an evolutionary antiviral mechanism whereby it reboots mitochondrial integrity in the immune system. It's quite extraordinary. So do you, do you use melatonin as part of your? Protocol? So I wrote about melatonin in here. You did? Okay. Uh, it's not part of my basic protocol. We don't start people on it. Um, now for those few patients that we had that were, were rougher and, you know, not responding and, sh- you know, the shortest breath wasn't getting better. I did put them on melatonin and I'm quicker to put them on melatonin now than when I wrote that paper. And when I wrote this book and I use big doses of melatonin what, you know, what are those doses? When they're sick, 60 to 80 milligrams a day, usually at bedtime. And the only side effect, you know, melatonin is a non-toxic substance. There's, there's no known toxicity for melatonin. Um, the, the one side effect I see with a, a blue moon patient is they get groggy the next morning after taking melatonin at bedtime, or they have nightmares from it. Those are very few and far between. If they don't have nightmares, they're not groggy the next morning. And they can take a half a milligram or a milligram of melatonin. They can take hundreds of milligrams usually and not have side effects with it. So I, through different trial and error things, it seems like bigger doses, like 60 to 80 milligrams when they're sick, um, decreases the chances of cytokine storm. And, and Maybe it, even melatonin in higher doses might be helpful to avoid long COVID. Who knows? That might be one of, because now we look at Columbia University, we look at Cleveland Clinic, and we see that they're re- realizing that melatonin has a protective effect in this illness. You know, it's interesting, though, I was, um, I had Dr. Schallenberger on my show, but he, we didn't talk about melatonin then. And I heard from a number of people that he's now prescribing melatonin throughout the day in very large dosages for some of his cancer patients. So I did find, so I did a deep dive into melatonin about a month ago. I did find one paper, I'm going to find it and send it to you, where it showed that if you gave melatonin during the day, 
and I think this was an animal study, that there was an increased incidence in cancer. So I'm hesitant to give it during the day since it is a circadian rhythmicity hormone more in the evening, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And I remember when I was a scholar at Tulane, um, there was a physician, a MD, PhD, who made his career on melatonin, and he was discussing how it does its action at night. And one of the other things it does is block tumor cell uptake of glucose, and it reboots the health of your energy furnaces, your mitochondria. So it makes sense to me. It totally makes sense. And you know what I find with personally and with patients, if they take melatonin at bedtime, whether they're good sleepers or not, even if they're not good sleepers and they suffer with, you know, interrupted sleep or insomnia or something like that, they're better, they're more functioning the next morning. And I find that personally with myself, if I don't sleep well, if I take melatonin, you know, at night, I mean, I'm tired the next day. Maybe I don't feel as good as when I had a good night's sleep, but I'm just not as fatigued, not as brain fogged um, from the melatonin from not sleeping than if I didn't take the melatonin. It's so interesting, all these different uses of things, but I don't understand since we have prestigious institutions looking into these, why don't we have shows and discussions and discourse on this for potential ways of keeping yourself healthier? So thank goodness you wrote this book. Thank goodness you took the elbow grease to do that. So shows, why can't we just even talk about it, you know? You can't even talk about it before the letters come and the censorship comes. And it's, From your lips to God's ears, I hope I don't get a letter myself after this show. Just, it's just mind-blowing. It's just, um, um, I, 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 I can't believe I'm, you know, I, I saw the censorship. And I look, I, I've helped doctors out who get into trouble over the years. And I never charge anybody for, for going over the case or recommending things or writing an opinion or something like that. And then it happens to me. And... I, you know, when that two by four hits you in the back of the head, it's a lot different than just reading about it from other people. And I just, I just can't believe that this is, you know, I'm reading these books right now from Leon Uris that I read as a teenager, Exodus and the Hajj and Mila 18. And these books have so much more meaning now. And, you know, you read about Nazi Germany and the censorship and the book burning and, you know, how they took control of the population and they, and they took control of the population by instituting fear in everybody. Um, fear. Fear is what drives all of this. Fear, fear. fear of something. You know, Nazi Germany was fear of the Jews. The Jews were controlling this. The Jews were responsible for this. The Jews did this. So they rounded them all up and, you know, put them in their camps and things like that. And, you know, now we're fear of this virus, this virus that's killing at the rate of, of the flu. Now it's a serious virus. We've had a lot of people die. A lot of people sick. I've worked harder than ever. I've seen sick patients with it. I had the virus a few months ago. Um, I treated my staff with it. It rampaged my office. The good thing is in my office, we have 87% herd immunity, immunoglobulins, and our office is a herd immune place for COVID now. Although we did have to suffer through, you know, getting all getting sick and not working for a couple of weeks at a time. Um, but we got through it. And I don't know if this means anything, but you know, I work there in uh, Naples. We have about 17 people working there and I'm older and I'm flying back and forth. So I am, t- I want an extra amount of protection. And now that I've done the deep dive into ivermectin, oh boy, I want, I could do a whole show on why I think it might be helpful to do it once or twice a year, just to get rid of different microbial pathogens that are harsh on your immune system. But I've been doing that in a prophylactic manner and none of our staff has gotten COVID and knock on wood, I haven't gotten COVID yet because, you know, I have that one kidney. That's how I first met you is because I had the one kidney. So I've been, so there is a wide variety of things that you can do to be empowered. And that's how you deal with fear is you learn what's sensible to be empowered, which is why we have this show, why you wrote that book and why I'm forever grateful to you for your, your hard elbow grease. Well, you, you have some elbow grease on too. And we, you know, we've talked about that, but you know, I agree with you. People, people need to turn the TV, turn the news off, start reading and start educating themselves that this virus isn't killing everybody. This virus doesn't kill everybody who gets it. And, you know, look, when you get it and you recover from it, you should be immune for life for it. They're, they're telling people that got over this virus. You think they, so? They're saying that the, that the antibodies only last for four to six months. Those are, those are IgG antibodies, which, which, now they're saying it lasts for eight, at least eight months because that's the length of the virus has been going on. So they've changed that soon. 
but why should this be virus be any different than any other virus out there? And there's other Sounds immunities. Sounds like a Jewish line at Passover, <laughs> Manishtana. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that does sound. But, um, look, if, you, if we're going to vaccinate right now for it, I think the people who had it and recovered from it are feeling fine. They shouldn't be getting the vaccine. Let's save it for people that, that you know, if you're going to get it, you know, and that's another, that's another story on that one. Um, but I would say that the people who had it recovered from it, you should have lifelong immunity. There's other immunity besides immunoglobulins, IgG. There's T cell immunity. There's other forms of the, the adaptive immune system that have memory cells that r- should be able to respond to this. Um, I think the whole idea that they're scaring people, you know, it's the other fear factor. They're scaring people that had it recovered from it that you still need the vaccine is nonsense. Show me one vaccinated disease where the vaccine outlasts having the disease and recovering from the disease naturally. Just give me one one instance where that's the case. There isn't one out there. Um, measles, mumps, chickenpox, rubella, doesn't matter. If you've had the illness, you have lifelong immunity. If you have the vaccine, no, that's not true. The vaccine. You know, it is interesting. Uh, They're saying if you have higher titers of mumps or measles, uh, old antibodies, that you are much less uh, vulnerable to COVID. If you had the illness, not right. if you had the vaccine. Right, if, if you had the had illness. Had a, um, so, so... I think that that's another fear factor that's been thrown out there by the big pharma to convince every single one of the 330 million of us that we need that vaccine. And, you know, I guess, how can you blame big pharma? They have no culpability. They have no liability. Um, they already got 9 billion, you know, before this thing was even made um, in their pockets. And now, you know, how many more billions are they going to get? Um, but time will tell. Let's, let's see what happens. You know, um, the, the recent news on the vaccine, you know, look, I hope it's safe and effective. Um, you know, what? we'll see. But, the, you know, there's a nursing home in New York that vaccinated everybody. And 10 days later, they start this huge death rate from COVID. Um, in Israel, where 20, over 20% of the population has been vaccinated, they're suffering the, the worst death rate they've ever had right now. So could this be an example of pathogenic priming where the vaccine, um, this is similar to what happened with, um, what happened to the Philippines? It was dengue fever. They gave the vaccine for dengue fever to children. When they got sick with dengue fever, they died, you know. Uh, and ivermectin works against dengue fever. Yikes. No, so we'll see. Is this going to be pathogenic? <clears throat> Only time will tell. You know, we, we don't know. Um, but um, I think that there's things you can do to build your immune system. And it's ultimately your immune system. That's, that's the end goal, whether you're going to get vaccinated, whether you're going to get coronavirus or whether you're not going to get coronavirus. If that immune system is strong enough, it should be able to withstand coronavirus as well as it withstands influenza A and influenza B and RSV and all the other viral like illnesses that we're exposed to all the time. And, um, you know, you're not going to have a healthy immune system eating too much sugar and not drinking water and not exercising and you know being on your cell phone all day and, you know, sitting in the chair all day, just not going to happen. So again, this should be our wake up call and, you know, I don't know why we can't all have a holistic approach to viruses that supports our immune system. That's what we should be doing. I never claim a cure for COVID. I never claim taking vitamin A or D or any of this stuff cures COVID. It helps the immune system fight back, which is what ultimately needs to be done. That's why we have the immune system in the first place. So that's the deal. Learning how to help your immune system fight back on your own with whatever shows up and how to be an agile thinker. If you like information like this, if you like thinkers and discussions, conversations like this, please go to drlindsayberkson.com uh, forward slash membership because I have been developing a group of people that we get together and chat and talk and discuss this kind of information. Normally, I teach continuing medical education courses to physicians and pharmacists. All of those have been canceled, so my income got canceled. And so I ended up launching this online program so I can continue teaching and we could have these forums like we had this guest today, this honored, honored guest and dear friend today. Thank you so much, David, for giving us part of your Saturday in Michigan, me over here in Austin. I really can't wait to get your book and read it. And it's thank you for doing it. And sorry that you had to face all that stress on top of serving all your patients and facing the stress in your office. But thank you for always keeping your head above water. And now you've got two kids that are graduating that are carry your gauntlet forward. You know, it's interesting. My my daughter, who's uh, in her residency, said to me when I got those letters, gee, thanks for making me go into medical school. And I'm like, 
number one, I never made you go into medical school. That was your choice. And number two, I said, regardless of what happens with this. And at that point, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't, they could take my license. I could be done practicing. I could be retired. Um, I said, I wouldn't change a thing. I said, um, the only thing I could have changed was close the office, tell patients we're not seeing them. We can do, you know, you're on your own. What and a loss that would have been. What a go loss. To the, go to the air when you can't breathe. I mean, that's what I could have done. And I chose not to. And, um, you know, I wouldn't change anything. And medicine is a great field. It's just the censorship and this, this, this harshness that's there right now and this inability to discuss things is needs to be changed. And we just, unfortunately, it's not just medicine, it's politics. It's, you know, it's, it's what happened with the president. It's what's happened with Republicans and Democrats. It's happened with policemen, firemen, dentists. Well, it's happening everywhere. I know. It's terrible right now. And, you know, I think we all were a little bit nicer to each other and just heard each other's opinions. And then that's so dismissive and that's so name calling, you know, and just, you know, look, you, you don't have to agree with me. We can discuss it. I have friends who feel otherwise that, you know, that I do. And that's fine. You know, one of the, one of the person, one of my friends is an ER doctor. He, he convinced me to write that article that it was the peer reviewed article on this. And I told him, I'm not going to write the article. I got the FTC and the state board coming after me. And he says, you need to write the article. It'll give you some defense that you got a peer reviewed article that you published about it. And he's a conventional doctor. Him and I have had long discussions on therapies and vaccines and other things. Some of the stuff we end up agreeing with each other on, some of them we don't. And we send each other articles back and forth to critique. And, you know, we were just over their house for dinner the other night. And, um, you know, we, we were discussing things again. You know, they were, they were more positive about the coronavirus vaccine than I was. And my comment was, I'm not, I'm not negative about it. We don't know right now. It hasn't been studied. And why would you let something be injected in you that's a new therapy, hasn't been studied appropriately, and... For a disease that kills, you know, point oh, whatever the numbers are, the same as the flu, right? Point oh, two no, percent. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's this. I was doing the, uh, in fact, I just published a, this morning a letter to my mailing list. If you all want to be on my email list, because I send out different letters now and then, you can go to my website, drlinsbursa.com and sign up. But in that, I took the population of the United States and the population of people who have died from COVID. And it was one out of 625 people have died from COVID, which is a, oh. which is a fairly lethal rate. David. Well, hold on. Those are those are way inflated numbers because people aren't dying of heart disease. They're not dying of flu and pneumonia anymore. We'll see what the final numbers are. Well, I don't out. know if I totally agree with that because if you're in a car accident, but you have heart disease, you still died from a car accident. So if you have heart disease, but you have COVID and then you die, I mean, I know this is a huge, big, murky issue, but I don't know if I totally agree with that. Let's, let's see what the total numbers turn out to be. And when, when we look at the total mortality rate, which is not that much higher, and it's not 300,000 higher than um, it was last year, and I've been following these numbers, it's going to be a little bit higher, but not that much higher. We'll, we'll find out that COVID is not killing, it's killing the weak, and it's killing the older people. Um, and look, it's a lethal illness. I've seen it. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to deny that, but I think the numbers are way overinflated. You know, every COVID time thing. will tell, but I don't, you know, if this is really an important issue because this is a criticism of what's unfolding and I've been looking at it and I don't see it from that viewpoint, but I guess only time is going to tell what the true statistics are. We'll see. But um, um, look, every COVID case right now is a positive PCR test. We know the testing is suspect and, you know, people are getting multiple PCR tests. I've had, um, you know, I've talked to an ER doctor I saw as a patient yesterday she said the people are coming in the air because they can't go back to work till they get a negative PCR test. They're getting eight to 10 tests sometimes. That's a positive test every time. That's a, a new person being diagnosed with COVID according to the statistics. That's one person. And she said- Why is, why is that happening? Why is it like that? They can't that? go back to work till they get- they'll, they'll No, no, work. I don't mean that. Why if one person has multiple tests, that's counting for multiple persons when it's only one person? Is that what you're saying? They don't, they, one PCR positive test is a positive test for COVID. They don't really pay attention. That's a repeat test for somebody. They're just counting it as a positive test. Mm. I mean, the numbers are jacked. I see what yeah. you're saying. I see what you're saying now. Okay. So how are we going to, what statisticians are going to like tease all this apart so, so that we can understand the reality, the veracity of what's going on? Well, there's John Ioannidis who writes about this and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what the final numbers come out to be. Look, maybe... COVID is killing one out of 600 Americans. You know, we'll see. I think the numbers are less than that, but we'll we'll find out. 
And remember, 3 million Americans die every year from many things. You know, now we have cancer deaths down, you know, in enormously low rates. We have well, people are down. staying away from the hospitals because yeah. they don't oh, want to. No. Yeah. If people, I've, I've had patients who I had a, a 94 year old lady have a heart attack. She goes to the hospital. She dies in the hospital overnight and they swab her right at the end. She's already out. She's already unconscious. She's already ventilated. They swab her. Test comes back two days later. They change the diagnosis from heart disease, from uh, death from heart disease to COVID. That's just one. I've had a few patients with that example. So we'll, we'll see. She didn't. Okay. Die. So this is definitely the statistics surrounding what is, we're in the middle of living are very confusing as to what's happening and who to, that's part of the thing that's been the biggest issue for me in this, David. I don't know who to believe anymore. You know, it gets very difficult. The experts that we have, the politicians that we have, the the news media that we have, the science that we have. I hear one thing and I read, because I'm always reading the scientific articles and it's in conflict with the scientific articles. So I guess the biggest flashing red light for me has been, you have to become empowered yourself healthy yourself, because you can't really depend on outside of yourself. Look, Lindsay, there's illnesses like uh, Ebola and hemorrhagic fever that kill 40 or 50% of people that get sick with it. COVID ain't anything like this. COVID is killing at the same rate that the flu kills when you look at the number of people that have oh, it. Oh, I don't know if I agree with that. We're gonna, I'm, I'm going to have to do a deep dive and have some emails well, back and forth with you on this well, one. But well, it's good. Wait. I'm glad we're having, well, you know, breaking gluten-free bread and chatting about this. Let's wait until they come up with a total mortality rate from 2020. Because, look, they can't check that number. A death is a death. What the cause of death is is another story. But a death is a death. And we'll see. If, if the deaths are up 400,000 or 500,000 or whatever it is from the previous few years, then... Well, we wow. know that already for 2020, the deaths in our young people and our 20-year-old people, that is up significantly. That came out from Johns Hopkins recently. So okay. that th that is up. Those young adults are up, and th those were supposedly due to COVID. Well, remember, their suicide rates are up and drug abuse is up because people tis have been true, Tis true, and vaping mm -hmm. rates are up, as you and said. We'll, we'll see what the final numbers come out with all this stuff, but... um. You know, it's so dot, I, dot, dot. Some of this yeah. remains to be seen. Lindsay, keep in mind, there is there is financial incentive for hospitals to call it a COVID death because they get more money. They get $13,000 more for the admission and something like $29,000 more well, for the admission. Well, that's ICU. because it does cost them more money to deal. They have to have a dialysis machine there. They have to have, you know, intubation. They have to have a lot more machinery for a COVID patient that's in there. Anyway, I think we're going to need to, well, this is a great conversation and I'm expecting you hopefully to invite me over to your lake house so we can have sure. this for a dinner and chit chat and then eventually laugh our heads off at the end with a glass of wine <laughs> for whatever what? conclusions be, we come to. I'm really interested to see how this plays out at the end. And, um, you know, and I'm not minimizing COVID. COVID is something and it's, it's unfortunately, I'm sorry, I have to practice medicine through it. And um, it's miserable and people are miserable and they can't breathe. And it's, you know, it's a really a horrific illness. And, you know, I just don't think it's quite as um, lethal as what the CDC. Well, you know. know, so it's interesting is that go back to why I wrote that article in March is because the number of people are getting this ground glass opacity and lung scarring that are even asymptomatic. You know, we're seeing it, the lungs throw clots and the lungs look like smokers lungs. So, it's a very novel virus that randomly affects people in such a different way. The statistics are really up for grabs is what I hear you saying. We're not in agreement right now here with them, but it will only unfold over time, the tincture of time. But certainly the work that you are doing is so important and everybody should get this book. You should get this book. We will have the links to where to purchase this book at the show notes. And hopefully we'll have you come back and maybe talk to some of our Ooh. membership groups because everybody should have your book right now on their shelf. There isn't anybody that shouldn't have it. And, you know, regardless of whether the statistics are you're right or I'm right, it doesn't, or we're in the middle of the two of us, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You need a strong immune system. You need a healthy right, immune system. Exactly. It doesn't matter. I mean, well, well, let's let's wait and see how this plays out. And what my frustration is not so much with the numbers and the testing. And although, the, look, I got frustration with the testing. There's a lot of frustrations with the testing. But my frustration is, why isn't the CDC talking about how you can have a healthy immune system? You know That is so true. I was hearing a whole, you know, now that he's stepping down and I was listening to everything he was saying, it's just so much gobbledygook. And that's why your book is so important. It really you know, is. Dr. Fauci said somewhere in the last couple of months, you know, he's taking vitamin C and D. And, and he thought vitamin C and D. I think he's, he helped. added melatonin recently after the Cleveland and, and Columbia he, he, University. In that statement, 
you know, I think it helps the immune system and it can help you, you know, be stronger, you know, with COVID, something like that. So why don't you say it a little bit more? Why don't you say it a little bit stronger? Why don't you do some research on it? Why don't you quote some studies on it? And let's give some people something to do that should be able to help them if you look at the physiology and biochemistry of the human body. So thank you for being on this show. You can go to my website, drlindsayberkson.com, and I have a paper that um, was published in a medical journal too in June in the Townsend Medical Journal on COVID and also interventions. And now we have the holistic approach by Dr. David Brownstein, a family practice physician and a dear friend in Michigan. Thank you for your time, thank David. You. That was great. It was fun. Okay. Be well, my friend. Be well. Be well. And have me over where we can of course that would debate be and then laugh okay <laughs> bye 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 say give my love to your wife okay thank you we'll do okay bye bye <laughs>